Hello, and welcome to the recording of the neonatal resuscitation. Uh, in this one, we're going to go into anticipating and preparing for a resuscitation. Uh, so lots of communication here, uh, questions to ask to determine what the risk factors are, and that's going to be a primary component of this, is looking at risk factors, making sure we got the right equipment set up, how many people need to go, how many people need to be in charge of the baby if it's high risk, how many people need to be charged in the baby only if it's not high risk. Uh, so let's get into it. Objectives that we're going to be looking at. Uh, risk factors that can help predict which babies will require resuscitation. I'll tell you now that not all uh, times that the risk factors are, are there that we that we will have to resuscitate, but it just means we're more likely to resuscitate if we have those risk factors. So it's good to identify which factors might need more advanced resuscitation. Uh, we'll talk about four key questions to ask before birth. And these are the questions to ask the provider to help us understand what different risk factors there are and what to expect. Things like cord management will be in there. Should I expect delayed cord clamping? How long? A minute? Two minutes? 30 seconds? Are we stripping the cord, right? So things like that we'll talk about. Who should attend a birth, right? So what is is the uh, minimum requirements for um, for baby at birth, right? And so we'll talk about that. How to perform pre-resuscitation team briefing. This is a pretty important uh, aspect, especially if you already heard the previous lecture on uh, teamwork. It's making sure everybody knows their roles and what each person is doing. And team briefings really help us put together the whole big picture overall. Uh, we're also going to look at how to assemble and check resuscitation equipment and supplies. So make sure that we got an equipment list, which is in your NRP book. And then finally, accurate documentation. This is a key thing, and a lot of people skip over it. Documentation helps us understand how long it's been since we gave a dose, how long we've been resuscitated how long it's been since we started doing different interventions. So accurate documentation is a key thing and during our practices uh, that's something that I want you guys to develop at least somewhat of a skill in documentation. You never know, you'll never know, but that is a key role in resuscitation. All right, key points to look at throughout this whole presentation. So just overview here. Identify risk factors by asking the four questions when you go to the delivery. Some newborns without risk factors will require resuscitations. It is sometimes the most random thing. You have a term baby, term delivery, maybe it's an induction of labor, and something happens like the cord separates, and the baby will require fluid resuscitation. So things like that can happen. So some newborns without risk factors will require forms of resuscitation. Sometimes it's as little as CPAP, uh, dry stimulate, CPAP, PPV, uh, and moving on from there even. So just depends, but understand, uh, just because there's no risk factors doesn't mean that you might not have to use resuscitation. So be aware, be ready at all times to be able to perform it. Like I said in the previous video, expect the best, prepare for the worst, right? So I have all my equipment, I know where my equipment is, I know my equipment's ready to go if I need it, I know how to use it, I know when it was last checked. Uh, so I have all that information. Uh, now the next question is, uh, you know, do I have the skills to use it? So yes, always expect the best, but pre be prepared to uh, go with the worst of all situations. Uh, other key points here is we want at all deliveries a minimum of one qualified provider whose only responsibility, their sole responsibility, is management of the newborn, and that should be at every birth. And sometimes this includes uh, the labor and delivery nurse, an extra labor and delivery nurse, because most labor and delivery nurses have some of that training, um, uh, or even someone from the NICU, the neonatal ICU or nursery. Uh, so it just sort of depends from hospital to hospital, facility to facility, what that was. Uh, so a minimum of one qualified NRP provider who's only, and I'll circle that word, only responsibility is management of the newborn to attend at every birth. Risk factors, if there's risk factors that are present, that usually means we need at least 
two NRP providers solely for the baby present. So uh, at the facility I worked at, it was a neonatal nurse practitioner and me as the respiratory therapist. So both of us would go to that delivery. Both of us were in our, uh, were providers, neonate providers. Uh, and so we, our sole responsibility was just for baby, uh, just for baby, especially when those risk factors were there. A qualified team with full resuscitation skills should be immediately available for every resuscitation. That means if I need a third or fourth person, who's available? And this might look different at different facilities. Sometimes that's an extra labor and delivery nurse. Sometimes that's a charge nurse from the neonatal ICU or something like that. So it can vary from hospital to hospital and from facility to facility, but know who is that person, the extra resources, and uh, make sure that they are available if needed. And then finally here, supplies necessary for resuscitation must be available and functional at every birth. It doesn't mean it has to be crack open the, the box, you have to unwrap everything, you have to get it uh, open everything, and then you have to throw all the equipment away for the next delivery. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that supplies necessary for full resuscitation, so IVs, umbilical vein, venous lines, uh, your medications, your uh, TPS resuscitators, all that other stuff should be available or must be available, sorry, and functional for every birth. So we can't have any broken equipment uh, and just be like, oh, we'll get another one in a, you know, a couple of weeks or a month or so. No, everything needs to be there and ready to go. Uh, so making sure your equipment is ready to go is one of the first checks that I would do uh, as part of my shift uh, working in the neonatal ICU and attending those deliveries. So risk factors that we have to be aware of, we need to be prepared to resuscitate at every birth. It's not all births, uh, like I've said, I've gone to deliveries where it was an induction of labor, they gave the mom that Pitocin, and it was induction of labor, and sure enough, that baby had a poor transition for one reason or another. So even if there's no risk factors present, uh, you still should be ready and prepared to resuscitate at every birth, right? Don't let it catch you by surprise. Trust me, that's not a good feeling if it catches you by surprise. Like I said, expect the best. Expect, if anything, to give them warm blankets and a hat and, and be out of the room like they didn't even notice you, right? That's the best scenario. But if something goes sideways, then you should be prepared. So prepare for the worst, expect the best. Risk factors, if they are present, do increase the potential for transition support uh, and resuscitation. And we talked about this in the previous presentation where that could be something as minimal as drying and stimulating the baby to up to PPV, uh, CPAP, PPV uh, compressions if it's in a, a severe late stage medication. So it just depends. But if those risk factors are there, then our potential for transition support or a full-blown resuscitation is something to be ready for. In those cases, with those high risk factors, we might open extra equipment. We might get bring surfactant with us. We might bring things with us to help um, after the resuscitation, to help optimize care of this baby. So we're really going to have to communicate, and that's where we communicate before delivery as much as possible on what our expectations and what our goals are of that delivery. Risk factors really do help identify the correct personnel in attendance. Uh, I don't want people in attendance that aren't going to have the right ability or the right skill set to take care of this patient. So if no one there can intubate, uh, that's a very highly unfortunate situation. And intubation is one of those key steps that can help you effectively ventilate a kid. Yes, there's laryngeal mask airways, right? There's the alternate airways, but uh, we want someone with good airway skills that can do either a supraglottic airway like an LMA or uh, intubate a subglottic airway. So we need to make sure that we have people there that have the skill set uh, to put it in an umbilical line or to put it in intraosseous uh, to place all the monitoring. So once we know um, with the, they have risk factors, we need to make sure that everybody that's attending that delivery uh, that all skill sets are covered. Uh, some without any risk factors, 
some of these deliveries that don't have any risk factors at all, once again, will require resuscitation. It is completely random. It's hard to tell. Uh, I've had uh, parents that uh, where they came in and they were very sick, sick situation with their physiological needs. And sure enough, that baby comes out is just healthy and good transition. But others where mom is a super healthy individual, and sure enough, that kid's transition is just really poor. Uh, so it's just hard to predict those things. Yes, it's great when we have the risk factors and we're prepared for it, but um, what you don't want to have happen, once again, is not to be prepared and something bad happens. So make sure you're, you're prepared for the worst, but expect the best, right? Expect the best. Don't expect every delivery you go to to be just a whole uh, emotional trauma situation, but expect it to go well. Uh, and if things don't go well, then you're prepared to face that as a team. You've already communicated as a team of what your roles and responsibilities are. So make sure you know your roles and responsibility. And that goes into the, the pre-delivery meeting that you have. Potential risk factors uh, when we're looking at this. So I split it out into antepartum and interpartum, uh, intrapartum risk factors. So antepartum risk factors, if the baby's less than 36 weeks, uh, that can be a risk factor. Uh, let, remember, 37 weeks plus is term uh, for a baby. So the last organ system to develop is the lungs. So we have to be careful. Uh, the lungs, they might, these babies that are born close to term, but not quite term, they're called late preterm deliveries. Uh, these babies are more at risk for temperature issues, glucose issues, bilirubin issues, uh, and a little bit of respiratory issues. They might need a little CPAP or a high flow, things like that. It just depends on the baby. Uh, if they're over uh, post-term, if their gestation's over 41 weeks or over, uh, that's post-term, and those babies are higher risk for meconium aspiration, which is the bowel movement, the fetal bowel movement. Um, they're higher risk for a lot of other things uh, as well, especially LGA. They might be more prone to be LGA or large for gestational age, which could put them at harm for delivery trauma and mom at, hard for a, ha at a high risk for delivery trauma as well for both of them. Uh, eclampsia and preeclampsia. This is where hopefully you don't have to do an eclampsia. Uh, preeclampsia is where their, their blood pressure is high, maternal blood pressure is high. There's usually a higher level of proteins in their urine. Uh, there's vision changes usually. They have swelling of their feet and ankles, which is actually very common. The swelling of the feet and ankles is very common for pregnancy altogether, but uh, it's pre-seizure, right? And so usually their blood pressure gets so high that they're high risk for a seizing, and that would be eclampsy if they do go into seizure. So we're going to give mom lots of oxygen. We're usually going to give her some neuroprotective medicine like mag sulfate uh, to help with that. Uh, and then uh, make sure we, as soon as it's safe to do so, if we can't get mom's blood pressure under control, which we can do medications and things like that for mom's blood pressures, like nifedipine, beta blockers, we can do those, labetalol, right? We can do different medications to help with that. But if those can't be controlled, then we're going to have to deliver that baby. So preeclampsia uh, can put a big risk there. Uh, there's also something called HELP syndrome, H-E-L-L-P. Uh, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets is what it stands for. And when we're looking at that, that's another thing that can go along with preeclampsia and eclampsia. And if mom seizes, it's a very bad situation for both mom and baby. Uh, so maternal hypertension and preeclampsia, you notice both of those are there with that uh, pen mark that I did. But that's one of those things that we have to watch very closely because we might have to deliver that kid very early, uh, depending on how bad that is. Multiple gestation, if there's more than one kid in there, uh, more than just a singlet in there, then uh, that can put a potential for um, uh, different deliveries in there. Uh, fetal anemia, uh, if the kid doesn't have enough red blood cells, that can be a very hard time to get oxygen delivered to where it's supposed to go and metabolic waste uh, eliminated, polling or oligohydramnios, if there's too much fluid or too little uh, fluid uh, in there. And one of the things on a biophysical profile is amniotic fluid index or AFI. And so if you're like, hey, I don't know what that is, go ahead and 
uh, bring up on a search device uh, a biophysical profile and you can do images for it as well but one of those things is looking at amniotic fluid volume or an amniotic fluid index is what they use and that's something they get on ultrasound and it tells us that there's too much or too little um, amniotic fluid going on if there's too little well obviously that could be an issue with kidneys that can be an issue with um, the kids lungs not being developed enough uh, so we have to watch uh, things like that uh, fetal high drops if there's any congenital issues macrosomia uh, intrauterine growth restrictions which can happen due to a number of reasons uh, including uh, smoking smoking uh, is one of those things that causes vasoconstriction and reduces blood flow to baby and so baby is going to be smaller overall uh, any fetal malformations or if there's even no prenatal care uh, gone to a bunch of deliveries where mom didn't know she was pregnant and she came in with like what she thought was uh, something like irritable bowel pain or something like that some sort of abdominal pain and sure enough she's in active labor uh, so it happens so things like that we don't know what to expect we don't know how term that kid is uh, a lot of the times those moms will say that they were spotting uh, and so they thought it they were having periods. They were just irregular. So those are all things that we need to be aware of. So if those risk factors are there, uh, then that's where we would want obviously two uh, NRP or two skilled providers to provide resuscitation for those babies. Intrapartum risk factors. Moving on over. Emergency section, absolutely. One of our biggest uh, factors here is if it's emergent, then that's usually when they go general anesthesia if they don't already have a spinal in place. Uh, emergency sections, uh, if they go under general anesthesia, are usually done quickly. The general anesthesia doesn't affect baby uh, most of the time. However, why did they need the emergency section? Were the fetal heart rate tones down? Uh, was there bleeding too much? Like what's going on that they need the emergent, not urgent, not scheduled, but the emergent C-section. So uh, C-sections also put uh, risk for these babies at developing what's called transient tachypnea of the newborn or neonate uh, and that's where that fetal lung fluid doesn't get that squeeze uh, was they of uh, the thorax as they're delivered vaginally usually you get a thoracic squeeze that helps eliminate most of the fetal lung fluid and then the rest of it will be absorbed by capillaries and lymph tissue in the lungs but with a c-section they traditionally don't get that so they're at higher risk for that fluid hanging out in their lungs and causing some breathing issues for a little bit and they might need CPAP for a little while from that um, moving on to forceps or vacuum assisted delivery uh, that put both mom and baby when both of those are done and we'll go into it more detail uh, when both of those are done it can put both mom and baby at higher risks for things like tears uh, the baby could bleed things like that so uh, fractures can easily happen with baby so there's a number of things shoulder dystocia we could have a number of things that can go on with the forceps and vacuum deliveries uh, breach or other presentation whether it's frank breach footling breach where they come out feet first uh, any other presentation besides vertex which is the head down um, then it can pose a risk factor obviously going feet first versus head first um, fetal heart rate patterns that are abnormal so latent variable d cells uh, maternal general anesthesia we just talked about that with emergency sections uh, it depends how long they're in there but usually if we're doing that crash c-section we're going under general uh, it's a short enough time period between the time they start that and the time that baby comes out that most of the time that baby doesn't have as much depression from that uh, maternal magnesium therapy there's a treatment for that we'll go through that uh, placental abruption of course would usually mean an emergent uh, however there's partial placental abruptions remember the placenta is the lungs in utero and so if there's an issue with the placenta there's an issue with that baby's life support mechanism right just like on mechanical ventilation that's a life support mechanism so if there's something wrong with that life support mechanism things can go sideways pretty easily uh, if mom's bleeding if that's a, a sign of infection of chorioamnionitis right uh, we might have to give the kid or and or mom antibiotics um, opioids within four hours to delivery causing uh, suppression of the baby's breathing shoulder dystocia where the shoulder is caught up in there and difficult to deliver meconium steamed amniotic fluid which we talked about that being linked to 
our post-term baby up there. And then even a prolapsed umbilical cord can cause a lot of heart rate variabilities during delivery uh, and make it and squeeze off the blood supply to the baby during contraction. So uh, things like that can make it uh, transition hard. So when you see these risk factors, whether they're antepartum or intrapartum, that usually means that we need at least two sole providers for baby that are skilled and ready to go for full resuscitation. Now, obviously, can these risk factors be missing and the baby still have an issue transition? Absolutely. But if we know these risk factors are there, we can make a plan. Hey, we know that mom is getting general anesthesia or we know that uh, mom's gotten a lot of magnesium, is it possible that we might need to give them a medication to help reverse that depression? Absolutely. So we have that plan drawn out of what we're going to do and what we're expecting. Uh, so that way we're prepared. All right, so what questions should you ask before the birth? Now these are hopefully you're not walking in and the baby's already out and they're just saying fix it, right? Uh, hopefully you're, you're there before then. So based upon the responses to these questions, uh, we need to make sure we assemble the necessary personnel and the equipment. If it looks like the gestational age is 26 weeks, for an example, then we need to make sure we got all the right people for 26 weeks. We need to make sure we got the Neo wrap. We need to make sure the plastic wrap that we put the baby into. We need to make sure that we got the right size of equipment ready to go. So the right type of people, the skilled people for that type of situation, and the right equipment. Uh, uh, make sure that we, ha we understand these answers and we can communicate beforehand what our risk factors are. What is the expected gestational age? Once again, is this kid 41 weeks or over? Is this kid less than 36, 36 weeks or less? Uh, then we sort of know there's risk, more risk factors available. Let's get a, another person here with this delivery. Is the amniotic fluid clear? That tells us that there's a meconium stain fluid. If it's fetid in yellow, that tells us there could be a chorioamnionitis, a, an infection going on. Uh, is there any additional risk factors we should be aware of? Yes, mom has preeclampsia and so on and so forth. Um, so we un asking these questions are going to help us determine what risks or if any risks there are that we need to get stuff ready for and the right people ready for. What's our umbilical cord management plan? This is uh, one of those things called delayed cord clamping is out there and there's a lot of advantages to it which we'll talk about in other lectures uh, but the delayed cord clamping can be anywhere from stripping the cord really fast uh, and that's pushing all that umbilical blood into baby uh, and that could help even if we have to resuscitate quickly that's something where they can do they can strip the cord uh, and that just pushes that blood into baby or they can delay it for a minute to two minutes traditionally uh, to allow for that cord blood to keep going into baby it gives baby some extra red blood cells extra volume therapy uh, extra ability to carry oxygen and remove co2 uh, the big downside of it it is a it could in theory delay care but that's why we strip the cord you know instead of waiting for it to go naturally uh, or it could be a higher risk of bilirubin uh, there was a study by the American College of Obstetrician Gynecologists that showed uh, that published by the ACOG uh, that showed a decrease in intraventricular hemorrhage or brain bleeds by 50 percent uh, when they had uh, a delayed cord clamping or a stripping of the cord. So it's pretty important. So what's our co umbilical cord management plan is a good thing to talk about because I'll start the APGAR timer uh, when the baby's out, but if I don't get them until two minutes of age, it's that's what I need to know. Are we just waiting for the cord blood to go into baby? And that's a good sign if they're healthy enough just to let that cord be delayed in there. So the time uh, the umbilical cord clamping or plan of management is covered in more detail in chapter three. So we'll get to that in a little bit later. But these are the questions to ask when you show up at uh, delivery. So don't be shy, right? These help us understand the situation and appropriate personnel and the appropriate equipment much better and help us get ready uh, in a way that will be most helpful to that situation. All right, who should be at the delivery? Well, a minimum of one qualified 
in the initial steps of, uh, of, of newborn uh, care should be there and positive pressure ventilation uh, is one of the key requirements of that and their sole responsibility is baby management so they can't be both taking care of mom helping the OB out and doing baby no it has to be someone just there for baby they can't be running around doing other tasks right that's too much division so that would be uh, in a lot of just healthy deliveries an extra L&D nurse uh, other facilities, it might be the neonatal nurse practitioner, or it might be an RT, or a nurse from the nursery, right? A NICU nurse, or something like that. So, just depends on the facility that you're working at. Uh, but at least one qualified in the initial steps of newborn positive pressure ventilation with the sole responsibility of baby management. Once again, they can't be running around doing things for other providers, right? They're there for baby management. Uh, the risk factors, if there are risk factors involved, that means we have two people. So if I say mom has preeclampsia, then we're going to say we're going to have two qualified people solely to manage the baby. Uh, so anytime a risk factor is there, we need at least two people. Now, if we have one person, right, if we have one person that's at a delivery and there's no risk factors and things go sideways where this baby needs further resuscitation, they need to be able to call for help, right? They need to know who to call. They need to have that down, a system down to help with that management. But if there's risk factors involved, we need a minimum of two people solely to manage baby. Once again, that can't be someone that's doing things for other providers. Uh, qualified team uh, skills. The skills uh, should include uh, someone that has the skill of intubation, someone that has the skill of compressions, someone that has the skill of getting emergency vascular access, whether it's intraosseous or umbilical, uh, medication administration as well, drawing up and administering medications. Uh, but the full resuscitation team should be present at birth if we anticipate resuscitation. I remember going to a delivery where I could hear the fetal heart rate go lower and lower and lower. And we were waiting for a spinal to kick in uh, that uh, that mom was refusing uh, general anesthesia at that point. So we were just waiting for the spinal to kick in. Uh, by the time they were able to get to baby, once the spinal kicked in, the baby's heart rate was less than 30. Um, and so we were expecting a full resuscitation. And so uh, that's where it was myself and the NNP, and we were working that situation there. Uh, we, both of us together, were a full resuscitation team. We had intubation, compression, emergency vascular access, and medication administration skills uh, between us. And if we needed another one, we could always uh, get our charge nurse. And that's how it was at the facility that I worked at. But uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, practice scenarios is going to be one of my key things with uh, with the course here uh, to make sure you have sufficient personnel immediately available uh, to perform all the necessary tasks. But these are the skills that you're looking at minimum for these two providers or for the team to to be able to perform. Uh, they should be proficient in those skills: intubation, compressions, vascular access and or medication delivery. Okay, so this gets into the pre-resuscitation team briefing. Hopefully you have a chance or time to do this as you go to these deliveries. So uh, if we're expecting a preterm baby at 25 weeks, 28 weeks, right? We can't hold that baby off any longer. They're not looking very healthy in utero. We need to deliver this baby sooner than later. Let's say the placenta is not healthy or something like that's going on. Then we might have to go ahead and deliver. So what we need to do is a pre-resuscitation briefing. So we're going to look at the clinical situation. What are the risk factors um, and the management plans? All right, what's the plan? What are our four questions, right? So we're going to look at our, our, our situation and see do we need uh, any additional support beyond what we currently have? Um, is there uh, the clinical situation and management plans developed during the antenatal counseling? Traditionally, what this means is they'll have a meeting with the parents. Uh, one of my kids was a 25-weeker, and uh, they, the neonate team uh, did come in and discuss with us uh, what the what the course or the plans were for that and so that's an antenatal counseling uh, and that's what we have a plan and a course so that's all things that we want to communicate to each other 
then we're going to identify a team leader uh, when we when we're doing our pre-team leading. So who's going to make the calls? You can't have everyone making calls. Now everyone has the right to speak up if they see something that's necessary to the resuscitation. However, uh, we need a person that's making the calls, that's following the chart, that's going through it. So identify a team leader. Make sure we delegate tasks to each person. Hey, when this person comes out, uh, I want you to put on the pulse ox and you're gonna listen for the lung sounds. Uh, I want you over there to put an EKG monitoring on and I want you to go ahead and suction and dry and stimulate as needed. And the other person over there, I want them to go ahead and get re intubation supplies and medication supplies ready if it comes down to that, right? So we're delegating tasks uh, to the different members of the team. Uh, identify who will document the situation. I can't tell you how many resuscitations I was involved in where we actually didn't have someone documenting until we've already started through a couple rounds of our resuscitation. Uh, so this is a good thing to do pre, uh, before the situation happens, because just telling someone to pick up a pencil and a paper or whatever's available uh, at the last second really doesn't put them in a good place uh, to succeed. Uh, determine the supplies and equipment needed. This should be done well before any deliveries that day, right? Checking that delivery cart uh, is an important thing, but make sure that we know the supplies needed. If we know we're going to a 26 weeker delivery, then we know what size, what type of supplies are needed, what that, make sure that all the tanks are are adequately filled and our FiO2 is appropriately set and our heat's appropriately set and our equipment's appropriately set up for such a delivery. So make sure everything's ready for that. And then if we need additional help, identify how we're going to call for help. Hey, if we need someone else to help with us, we're going to call this number uh, and that's the charged nurse in the neonatal ICU they're going to come over and help us, right? So we've identified this. So this is our game plan, if you will, uh, before the resuscitation happens. Uh, pretty important thing here, so make sure you hit all these mar marks. We know what, what the plan was with the antenatal counseling. We have a team leader. We know each person knows what tasks they're going to do. We're gonna know, including documentation, we're going to make sure our supplies are ready to go. And then we've all communicated about how or when we're going to call for additional help. So pretty important aspect here. Uh, I know this slide looks very simple, but I can't overstate it enough that this is a key component to calming a lot of tension during the resuscitation and making sure we have a successful plan. All right, concept check. Obstetric providers tell you that the mother has just received a narcotic analgesia. Uh, what do you anticipate happening and how do you prepare for this as a team? So here you are as a team and you are given this information. All right, I want you to pause and think about how you would approach this. So go ahead and pause. All right, you've thought about how you're going to approach this. Uh, one thing is to make sure that we're going to be prepared for a sedated baby that may require assisted ventilation because that narcotic could suppress their, their ventilatory drive to breathe. So we need to discuss as a care team who will perform the initial assessment, who will stimulate the baby, who will start positive pressure ventilation if we need it, and who will document the events, right? This goes back to that previous slide that pre-use uh, game plan that we have. So make sure, even in a situation like this, we, we know what the plan is, we know what we're about to expect, a sedated baby that might not have adequate ventilatory drive. Uh, who's going to do the assessment? Who's going to stimulate the baby? Who's going to start PPV if we need it? And then who's going to document this? So make sure that you're going through this pre-use check, pre check uh, and we'll practice this as a team uh, as well. All right, supplies and equipment needed, uh, and you'll see uh, pictures of this in your book too. We need everything necessary for a complete resuscitation. It must be readily available. It doesn't mean it has to be cracked open and turned on and all that stuff, but it needs to be readily available and functional at every birth. We can't have any broken equipment there. Uh, high risk means equipment is now ready 
for immediate use. So that's a whole separate thing. If we know this delivery is going to require intubation, if we know this delivery is going, the fetal heart tones are very, very poor and we're expecting resuscitation, this is a high risk delivery and we need to make sure this equipment is ready for immediate use. So we already have a tube size, we already have all that equipment ready to go versus making sure we have everything available, right? Everything should be available, but if it's high risk, everything should be ready, right? See that two, two words there. Um, so equipment that you're looking at here, a heater, a warm preheated warmer is great, especially if you're delivering in the operating room uh, with a C-section or a vaginal delivery in the operating room. So make sure that warmer is at an appropriate temperature. There's warm towels and blankets. Uh, the temperature sensor uh, should be available if it's a prolonged resuscitation. Uh, we don't want kid getting too hot or too cold. A plastic bag or plastic wrap if they're under 32 weeks, right? That's important. They don't have brown fat yet, so they can't really keep heat in, so they can get cold very quickly. A thermal mattress, uh, uh, we have one at the school where we can show you that, uh, to place underneath them. So they'll get heat from up top with the warmer, and then they'll get heat from below. And the hat, right? And that's where they lose a lot of the heat uh, there, plus the hats are adorable. So, you know, there's that bonus. Uh, clearing the airway, a bulb syringe is very helpful. However, you might see some people use a DELE, D-E-L-E-E, -E, a DELE, a suction trap, uh, 10 French, 12 French suction catheter. Uh, and we typically set that at 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Uh, if you don't know, uh, just set it at 80, right? And we can always turn it up for there, but always follow your hospitals policy and procedure, a tracheal aspirator, anything like that. Uh, next, a stethoscope. There should be one uh, tethered to the warmer, but if not, make sure there's one available and ready for use. That's great for auscultating the heart rate, auscultating if you got breath sounds, auscultating if you got bowel sounds, if you intubate <laughs> right in the wrong place, uh, stomach sounds. Uh, so making sure auscultation is a good thing to make sure you have. Uh, ventilate. Make sure we got a flow meter with blended gas, uh, so air and oxygen uh, concentration. That's where you see the oxygen blender. So flow meter, usually we set it at 10 liters per minute. Uh, there are cases where we might change it from there. Uh, PPV device of some sort, whether it's a, a bag and mask or a T-piece and mask resuscitation. Uh, oxygen blender, set it at room air uh, is the default, so room air to 30%. Uh, is what we're looking at there. Uh, term and preterm size masks. Uh, OG tube uh, is very helpful, especially if they have a lot of gastric insufflation going on or a lot of fluid in their stomach. LMAs, uh, laryngeal mask airway, a superglottic airway of some kind to help assist ventilation if it's a situation like a Pierre Robin or let's say they have a laryngeal web, uh, something like that where we can't get a subglottic airway, then we need a superglottic airway. Uh, five or six French OG tube, uh, uh, if insertion port present on the LMA uh, for a different purpose there. So access to cardiac monitor leads is a kind of a big thing that I like because uh, pulse oxes tend to take a while before they can pick up. Perfusion is very poor on these kids traditionally, and getting good perfusion to the right upper extremity can take a while and take a lot of work. So an EKG can really tell us about heartbeat and perfusion uh, very early on. Oxygenation, uh, equipment to give oxygen, right? That goes into your flow inflation bag and mask or T-piece. A pulse ox, uh, usually for the right upper extremity. Uh, the, that target oxygen saturation table you'll see on the NRP slide that we had on that previous pe presentation. You also see a picture of it in your book. Intubation stuff, we need a size zero, uh, size one, but a double zero is, op is says optional here. Uh, it just really does depend on your facility. Uh, the facility I worked in had a double zero, zero, and one. Uh, zero was a great default one if you don't remember the sizing on it, but a double zero is great for your micro preemies. Uh, stylet is optional. Make sure that the tip, if you use it, the tip of the stylet stays within the ET tube, that it, there's no way for it to go past the Murphy's eye or the end of the ET tube. Uh, endotracheal tube sizes, two and a half, three, three and a half. 
Um, some places will have a 4.0 for a meconium aspiration post term. It just depends on your stuff there. Uh, uh, exhaled CO2 detector. These are usually the color changing ones. Uh, it may take a while if the kid has poor perfusion to their lungs, which they do, right? That's part of the transition before this changes color. So don't expect color change right away traditionally. It may take a while for that CO2 detector to change colors because remember, their circulation is transitioning to going through the lungs. So that could take a little bit there. So make sure you uh, auscultate their chest and their abdomen all right, for intubation because you'll usually hear it there first. Absent belly, bilateral chest, all right, it still may take a while for the end title to show up. Uh, measuring tape or uh, tube insertion depth uh, table, right? So we know how deep roughly we're going to do. Uh, it's their weight in kilos plus six, if I remember right. Uh, scissors to help trim anything that we need to trim. Uh, waterproof tape or tube securing device. You'll see different ones out there. And finally, medications we need access to. Doesn't mean we need to necessarily have them open. Uh, epinephrine. Uh, one milligram per 10 mLs. Uh, usually we need flushes as well uh, to help flush all that stuff in there. Normal saline, uh, 100 mL or 250 mL bag. You're not going to use your liter uh, bag or your half liter bag, right? Use a quarter liter, right? Uh, 250 mLs or 100 mLs. Uh, or if you have pre-filled flush syringes, great. Um, but we need to be able to flush and or give a, an infusion of normal saline. Uh, and usually an infusion of normal saline for volume expanders is 10 mLs per kilo. Supplies for placing an um, umbilical venous catheter. Uh, so we should have that uh, to help give central access. Uh, and then emergency medication dosages uh, that are pre-calculated for babies that are uh, a half a kilo all the way up to four kilos. So that way we, we don't have to de do any math uh, unless we're checking ourselves there. But Okay, so we've gone through equipment, we've gone through our risk factors, uh, and now the big thing is team leader characteristics. So what are some things that show a good team leader? Well, any member who has a mastery of the NRP algorithm and has effective leadership skills can be a team leader. Notice it doesn't say it has to be the most highly uh, highly decorated, the, the one that has the most seniority. It doesn't have to be the person that has the highest degree in the room, the person that went to the most prestigious university, right? It doesn't have to be any of those things. It's the person that has a mastery of the NRP algorithm. and and they really have good leadership skills. Uh, and so it, it's not limited to a physician or a nurse practitioner, right? It's not limited to those roles whatsoever. It's the person that has a master of the algorithm has effective leadership skills. It's not required to be the most senior member or the most advanced degree. If, if you're the sole baby provider and you have an unexpected resuscitation, you become the team leader and you need to direct the people around you until the full resuscitation team arrives. I had this situation, we had a kid that was born outside of the hospital, it was during the middle of winter. Kid came in, it was super cold, super cold newborn. And so of course, my primary course was to turn on our warmer in the emergency department and then get ready just to warm that kid up and bag. But I was the first NRP or first neonate provider there. And when I th the baby came in, they put the baby in the warmer. They were originally going to put the baby in a gurney with a bunch of blankets, but uh, I, I think the warmer was a better call. So I put the baby in the warmer, and all of a sudden, they were asking me what I needed, what I needed help with, right? So in that situation, somehow, some way, I became the team leader. So uh, until the nurse practitioner arrived, then I I gave that away. <laughs> I gladly gave that away. But uh, so you become the team leader if you're the sole provider. Uh, and then you, that means that you need to know what you need. I need someone to put on a pulse ox on those kids right up her arm. I need someone to go ahead and continue to give warm, dry stimulation. I need someone to listen for lung and heart sounds. I need someone, so on and so forth, right? You're delegating these roles. I need someone to put a three lead sticker on this kid and give me some rhythms, right? So the big thing here, give clear directions, share information, and then make sure you're delegating responsibilities to coordinate the care. Make sure everything's covered. So you gotta have that big picture. Now, uh, we'll talk about another slide. If 
if you are the one that's skilled at intubation and no, no one else on that team is, then that means you might have to delegate leadership temporarily or for the rest of it to another member while you perform that procedure. So is it okay to change team leaders? Well, as long as communication is clear and appropriate for that change to happen, then yes, it's, a, it's okay to change that. Uh, but we need to make sure that everybody has the uh, communication on board of who is the new team leader. The team leader characteristics must include uh, maintaining a professional environment. Uh, there's a lot that can, a lot of emotions and stress that goes on with any resuscitation of any person of any age. Um, and then when you add a newborn baby to it, uh, that's where things can get a little interesting. So maintain a professional environment. Make sure you're hearing closed loop feedback is another thing, right? Make sure you hear and repeat back what, what is going on. So use your resources. You make sure you're allowing all the team members to contribute their talents to the resuscitation. If you have uh, someone saying, hey, I don't see chest rise anymore after we've intubated this baby and confirmed placement. Hey, I don't see chest rise anymore. That's an important thing that we may not catch up on. And then we need to know, oh, yep, the tube came out. They, they're accidentally extubated, right? So these are things we need to watch out for. So use the resources by allowing all team members to contribute their unique talents to the resuscitation. If someone's very good at putting in umbilical lines, like that's the person that you want. But you need to remain aware of the entire clinical situation. Keep the big picture if you're the team leader. What is our next step of the algorithm, right? You're always, what's the next step? Who's doing what, right? And so this is an important aspect. If the leader is involved in a procedure that diverts their attention, then you may need to appoint another qualified person to assume a leadership role. And like I was just talking about before, if you're the one that's putting in, let's say you're the team leader and you're putting, your plan is to next put in an umbilical venous catheter to give epinephrine and or fluid resuscitation, at that point, uh, will you have enough attention to be looking at the big picture? Will you have enough attention to be uh, able to address if the endotracheal tube comes out, right? So that's where you might need to go ahead and uh, give your leadership over to another provider. There's nothing wrong with that. You're just ensuring the care is as appropriate as possible. Closed loop communication is a key aspect here. Uh, closed loop communication, each member shares responsibility for their ongoing assessment. Each member shares responsibility. It's not just the team leader. It's a shared responsibility for the assessment. If, if we haven't checked uh, if their heart rate's coming up after 30 seconds of ventilation uh, that we think is effective, uh, then we need to speak up about it, right? If someone missed something, speak up, right? So we all share responsibility for the ongoing assessment of that baby, right? We're in it as a team. It's not individual providers doing their own things quietly. It is a shared responsibility. Uh, professional environment, shared responsibility. So we need to share information and communicate in order to be successful. If somehow someone didn't, wasn't paying attention, or maybe they felt like they, they didn't have a voice to speak up that the chest rise wasn't there anymore, then that's an important thing. And now we, we spent time without giving effective ventilation to this baby. That's a big thing. We just filled this baby's stomach up with a bunch of air, and that could lead to a lot of bad situations. So shared responsibility, speak up when you see something. When you're given an instruction, make sure, uh, when you're giving an instruction, make sure that you direct the request to a specific individual, right? Make sure you tell them, hey, I want you, Jennifer, to put in an umbilical venous line. I want you, Jessica, to put in, uh, put on a pulse ox on this baby and make sure that they get wrapped in the neo wrap. Uh, I want you, so on and so forth, right? Make sure you direct that, that request to a specific individual. Call your team member by their name. That's what my examples were. Uh, make eye contact with them to make sure that they're just not task saturated and they're not paying attention because their brain is on a whole different level. So speak clearly, make eye contact, use their name. And this is all important as part of that pre, uh, pre, uh, pre-delivery uh, team uh, plan. So make sure 
After you give an instruction, ask a receiver to report back as soon as it's complete. So if you tell Jennifer to put in an umbilical venous catheter uh, for administration of fluids or medications, ask her to let you know when it's complete, when it's when it's in good placement. All right. So I would need you, Jennifer, to put in an umbilical venous line and then let me know once you've completed that task. Right. And so that's why when she says it, then you'll know, OK, now we can give our one milligram of epinephrine with a flush. And now I know I can give my 10 ml per kilo normal saline. Right. So that's great instruction and in closed lip communication. And after you get that instruction, repeat the instruction back to the sender. So if you're the one receiving the instruction uh, from the team leader to put in the umbilical venous line, then you're going to repeat. I'm going to put in an umbilical venous line and I'll let you know once it's complete, right? You're just closing that loop to make sure that they heard you as well. Documentation. Uh, documentation is a great uh, thing that people tend to misplace or tend to devalue. Don't. Uh, the documentation is our one of our key, uh, key things to know how long it's been since we've done this, how long we've been going on, how much medication we've been given, what time were they intubated, what time did we start this procedure or that procedure. Uh, so documentation is a very key role, so don't devalue the documentation part. Uh, documentation, uh, make sure that if you're the one documenting or whoever it is, make sure they're documenting the events as they occur. It's not something that's done afterwards. Uh, it's a very important for decision making. It is our source for quality improvement as well. Uh, make a recording on paper or program immediately available. So in other words, there should be a piece of paper and something to write with, or there should be a computer program that they have to document all the stuff in that they can go ahead and do and it's immediately available. They shouldn't have to go run to a nurse's station and grab a pen and paper, right? That's not appropriate. So make sure everything's readily available for that. Uh, usually there, it takes some skill development to do this. Uh, so I do want you to practice this in our labs, in our scenarios, and we need to make sure we assign someone, uh, whoever we're assigning this to, someone that's comfortable with communicating with team members so they can't be shy about saying what time did the ET tube go in, what time did the umbilical line, was, what time was the epinephrine given by umbilical venous line, right? How much was given, they need to be able to communicate with the team members. They can provide decision support to the team leader. So that's the team leader second eyes. Uh, so if they're thinking about the next part of the algorithm, they can be a helper there. Uh, they are the keeper of the time of events. So their watch is what we're going by, right? Their stuff is what we're going by. They know how long it's been since we started epinephrine. They know how long it's been since we've done you know, procedure X. So make sure that that person uh, is the keeper of all that information. We're not disputing uh, based upon anybody else's experience there. It, this person is not responsible for other critical tasks. Your documenter person cannot be the person putting in lines, intubating, so on and so forth. That's not their responsibility. Uh, their role is a critical role. Don't devalue it. It's a critical role, but it's a role that requires their full attention because they have to hear everybody in the whole situation and put it into words and an understandable uh, recall of the situation. That is a hard task. Um, so this person should also clarify uh, communication that follows the NRP algorithm. Let's say if the provider says, I want to give you one milligram of epinephrine per 100 mLs of solution. Well, no, it's one ml of one milligram of epinephrine for t uh, for uh, 10 mLs of solution, right? So this person can help clarify and help the team follow the NRP algorithm. So we are going to have you guys all practice accurate documentation in these scenarios. All right, post resuscitation. Uh, this is going to be a debrief, and this is a great thing for the team to uh, discuss the situation, learn and grow. Um, and even praise in some situations, praise each other, praise the the situation. It's it's a really I think important and undervalued as well uh, part of resuscitation is that team debriefing. 
So we need to have a constructive review of the actions and the thought processes that were going on. This isn't a blaming game, right? That's not the point of it. Uh, it does promote reflective learning, right? It helps us understand uh, moving forward what, what had happened and what we did. Uh, and it does reinforce good teamwork habits. Hey, J uh, Jennifer, I really liked how you put in that umbilical line really quickly. You used closed loop communication. You told me that you had it in once it was complete and we were able to give that as soon as it was possible. So this really does help reinforce good teamwork as well. So it's not just for bad things. All right. Well, it's also for the good parts that went on as well. Uh, we can see areas for improvement. Hey, when this happened, we could we said uh, uh, 100 mLs, uh, one milligram of epi per 100 mLs instead of one milligram of epi per 10 mLs for the epinephrine dose. Right, that's an area of improvement, right? Maybe we can go over our do dosages again. Maybe we can go over that part of resuscitation again, right? Uh, and this can be performed immediately after the event. Uh, so give people time, right? What to make sure everybody's stable, right? And make sure the baby's stable and everything. But it can occur after the event to make sure uh, there's nothing anyone saw, nothing needs to be. Um, further documented on uh, if something was missed. Uh, more comprehensive ones might be done a short time afterward, and those are the ones that I was most familiar with, are the ones that occur later on in the day after that event uh, versus just immediately afterwards. Uh, I even went to one that occurred uh, sort of the week after because it was a very unique ethics case uh, that we were involved in. So uh, that one was obviously more comprehensive, um, and that was a short time afterward. It wasn't months afterwards. It was just, you know, a couple of days afterwards. Uh, you do not have to find any major problems for these these meetings to be impactful. So that's one of the cool things there is just sort of reinforcing things that we're doing well, things that we could do differently. And sometimes it's like, you know, we did a pretty good job. It's a good reinforcement. So uh, you don't have to find any major problems to think that those team meetings are useful. It could be just, you know, let's keep doing this. We're doing a good job here. Uh, and it's just a great time to make sure that everyone's debriefed and it's also not a bad time to make sure everyone's doing uh, psychologically okay, emotionally okay after such a thing. Um, they may identify a series of small changes with these that can result in improvement, performance, and outcomes. Hey, what if we change to a tube called the Curtis tube for meconium aspiration versus doing uh, an endotracheal tube with a meconium aspirator adapter? So different things like that could really help improve uh, the team's performance and outcomes uh, when we're doing these debriefings. So something to think about. But don't ever hesitate to show up for a debriefing. Uh, it is not one of those penalty situations where you're expecting people to yell at each other. Please do not. Please do not. All right. Last slide. So we're here we're going to talk about different questions. What are the four pre-birth questions to ask the obstetric provider? So now is your time to think through. And if you don't know off the top of your head, then you're probably going to have to go back and look because I'm not going to give it to you here. So, ha. Uh, I want you to go back through. I want you to think about what are the questions I'm going to ask when I show up for a delivery. I want you to ask these questions when we're doing our scenario practices in the lab together, right? If you don't ask those four questions, how can you really help determine the risk factors? If I said the baby's not available to two minutes, that's because you didn't ask about, here's one of them, didn't ask about the cord management plan and they wanted to wait two minutes minutes, right? So if you didn't ask about any other maternal risk factors, that's a pretty important thing. If you didn't ask about the gestation and that this was a preterm baby, how do you know to get ready for all the preterm stuff? How do you know what size tube? How do you know that the temperature control is going to be an issue? So if you don't understand those things, if you don't have those under your belt, it really can hurt you. So those four pre-birth questions, I want you to get those down. Their importance. Uh, every delivery should be attended by at least how many qualified persons who are only responsibility is to manage the newborn. All right, it should be at least one qualified person whose only responsibility is to manage the newborn, right? They're not there to run around, do other procedures for this person and that person. If a high risk birth is anticipated, we need at least two qualified persons 
that need to be present at the birth. So at least two, right? Does that mean we can't have more? No, it doesn't mean we can't have more. But after a point, it does. There's a lot of people that can get around that situation. Uh, a lot of uh, that have too many people there, and then it's very hard to take care of that baby. Uh, the, the anticipate potential complications and discuss how responsibilities will be delegated during the pre-meeting. Uh, so this is where we're discussing who's going to put what in. Okay, at what point would we give surfactant? And that's not part of resuscitation, but just before the delivery. At what point? Who's going to put on the pulse locks? Who's going to put on the EKG leads if we need it? Who's going to start positive pressure ventilation and get up ready for intubation if we need it? Who's going to get umbilical line accessories and fluids medications if we need it? Who's going to document if we need it, right? Right? So we need to all do that during that pre-team meeting. And then finally, true or false, a qualified nurse or respiratory therapist who has been trained in NRP ha and has strong leadership skills can be a team leader. True or false? The answer, of course, is true. Uh, it's th not the person with the highest degree. Uh, it's the person uh, that has good leadership skills, that has good quality training. Uh, that can do it. So it's not always the person that's gone to med school or so on and so forth. So make sure you have good teamwork and communication. Make sure your equipment's ready to go, available, and then make sure it's ready to go if needed. Uh, and then hopefully these PowerPoints are helping you out. But that's it for now.